Okay, recognize conditions for and calculate magnetic flux. Uh, sorry, recognize conditions for and calculate magnetic flux and induced voltage. All right, so we've got a little bit of maths uh, at the start. We'll walk it through. Uh, this part is all 4 1, this part's 4 2. Uh, we're going to kind of touch on 4 3 at the end, but that's just because, unsurprisingly, 4 2 leads into 4 3. So, we've got this new fancy symbol. Uh, another Greek symbol, uh, capital uh, phi, phi, yep. Um, so what we're going to do is set this thing to be what we call flux. So what is flux? Flux is basically how much of uh, something goes through. So you can think of it sort of as flow, um, but there's a little bit of asterisks around it. So what we're going to do... B, we already know from before, is a magnetic field strength. A is just going to be an area, and then this cos theta term we can ignore uh, if things are per perpendicular or parallel, um, but that'll come in at the end, so I'll add that in last. All right, well, magnetic fields are measured in Tesla, areas in meters squared. Um, so you could say the flux is uh, Tesla meter squares, not Tesla per meter square. Tesla times meter squares, so Tesla meter squares, but because that's a bit of a mouthful, uh, there's a unit called the Weber, W-E-B-E-R, um, shortened to WB. Alright, well, let's try to get our head around uh, this flux idea. I've drawn here a capacitor uh, circuit, great, I've got my electric field, and then I've got some, uh, some imaginary box uh, or square that uh, these field lines are going to run through. The stronger the voltage on this, the more positives you have on this side, the more negatives you have on that side. So the stronger the electric field, if I don't change the size of this imaginary box, uh, then as I increase that voltage, I'm going to get more and more flux. I'm going to get more and more electric field going through my imaginary square. Um, however, I could also change the size of the square, which adds a little bit of uh, confusion to the mix, but do bear with me. So I've enlarged this picture now. I've got some amount of voltage across my plates. So I've got positives this side, negatives that side. So my electric field is going from right to left. And here I've got a whole uh, lot of different size um, squares and stuff. Oh, so, so most of them are the same size. I've got one really big one. All of these are supposed to be the same size, just rotated relative to our perspective. So if I think about this guy and this guy, they both have the same number of uh, electric field lines going through them. So these two will experience the same flux uh, since the electric field is consistent in a capacitor. Okay, well, if I go down here, this guy would also be the same because he's still experiencing, to scale here, I've got two electric field lines, but he's going to be experiencing just as much uh, electric field as this guy, and this guy, and that guy. So these three all match exact same. This guy, however, he's partially outside the field, so he's only going to experience approximately half as much as these other three, because he's only halfway in to the electric field. Okay, fine. Well, what if I make it a bigger uh, imaginary uh, rectangle? Well, that's fine. Uh, this thing's going to experience roughly, well, a bit more than double, five to two. Uh, roughly. So if I make my imaginary thing bigger, it's possible if everywhere in there experiences the same flux density, then the whole thing will experience a total uh, greater flux. So he's got more field lines going through him, he'll experience more flux. Okay, well, what if we make the uh, thing totally flat? Well, if it's totally flat, the field lines aren't really going into it. So this guy is going to experience zero flux. So even though the square is sort of in the field, because it's flat to the field, it's not actually going through that. Uh, it doesn't have an area for the lines to come into because it's perfectly flat. So this is going to experience nothing. This guy is going to experience somewhere between nothing and one of these guys because he's at 45 degrees. Cool, and that's where your angle thing comes in. So if you're perfectly perpendicular, so these are my field lines, they're perpendicular to my imaginary uh, rectangle, that's fine. I'll just experience B times A, so whatever the uh, field strength is, multiplied by however big I make this imaginary rectangle, that's how big the flux is through that rectangle. Um, but if I start changing the angle, 
right? For the same size box that I've got, I'm going to get less and less lines through because if I've got here some of them that were just barely clipping the top, now they'll miss, and the same with the bottom, they'll just miss. Uh, so that's what that term takes care of. And if I go all the way down to there, my fingers do have some depth, but these are supposed, this is supposed to represent a perfect, uh, infinite, infinitesimally thin rectangle, so none of the lines will actually go through it, so it'll miss everything. That's that guy. Okay. Uh, da -da -da. So that's uh, drawn with electric field, but it doesn't have to be electric field, it could be magnetic field, and overwhelmingly that's what we're going to deal with. We're going to deal with magnetic uh, flux uh, for this. Uh, so this was drawn with an electric field just to get the idea of flux. We want to deal with magnetic flux overwhelmingly, um, which is what we actually use this equation for. So I've got my magnet. If I draw my imaginary rectangles around this thing, this guy, this guy, and this guy were supposed to be the exact same shape, but I've struggled to draw it. Um, these guys, all the field lines go through this, all the field lines go through this. Even though this is right to left, it doesn't matter, all of them are still going through. Same with this, remember, there's still the magnetic field in the magnet. So these three would all experience the exact same. These two out here, these are only going to catch the ones that go above. This one's only going to catch the ones that go below. So these would be, if they were the same area, these would be half as much uh, flux as these other three. Beautiful. Right. Um, this is just supposed to be a drawing uh, for this cos theta. If we think of um, the field lines going from right to left, so those are my field lines coming right to left. If I've got some imaginary rectangle, like I said before, if it's square on, that's great. Uh, that means that my uh, imaginary rectangle of my field lines are at 90 degrees. Cool. Cos of 90 degrees is 1. Uh, sorry, is... Oh, sorry. I misspoke there. Let me start that again. So if they're at 90 degrees to each other, that's great. That means we get the maximum, uh, the maximum possible flux. Uh, however, the way this measures is the angle this is said to be on relative to the uh, field lines is if I was to put an arrow out from the imaginary rectangle. So I've got my imaginary rectangle there. I can put my arrow either this way or that way. It doesn't actually matter. My field lines are pointing in the same direction as it or exactly opposite. If it's exactly opposite, that's just a matter of uh, you've got a negative in there, so you can flip things around depending on what you're doing with it. So they're in total agreement about which way things are going, either left or right. They're not talking about ups and downs at all. So that's great. If we're on that angle, so now my plane, uh, my rectangle, exactly uh, lines up with these lines, which means they'll all miss. Remember, we'd say that this thing is, uh, we put an arrow on that. So the arrow for the plane is straight up or down. These are all running perfect left, right. There is no agreement whatsoever. So that's going to end up with zero flux because there's nothing actually going through the rectangle and anything in between. So say this was at 30 degrees to the horizontal that way, my arrow is going to be up here. Okay. Uh, the angle between my field lines and the hand and the arrow that comes off my rectangle, that's the angle theta. That's what I've tried to draw there. Uh, it's got this same picture in your textbook as well. It's not the uh, cleanest thing to try and draw because you're trying to talk, talk about three-dimensional objects on a 2D plane. Hopefully the hand thing helped a bit. If not, obviously ask away. Beautiful, good, done. That's that, okay. Next thing, uh, from last time, uh, well, last topic, we ended up that uh, the force uh, acting on a uh, electrically charged object by a magnetic field was equal to the charge of the object multiplied by the velocity of the object moving through that field times by the strength of that field. So Q equals, uh, sorry, F equals QVB. We also know from before that work equals force times distance. Great. If we uh, combine these things, we'll notice that force, so I can cram all of this into there. So we get work is the same as QVB times D. Great. Uh, there's one slight uh, thing that gets changed on most formula sheets. Instead of talking about distances, it now talks about the length of an object. So that D turns into an L, and this will be a formula you find. So that just tells us the work uh, done by uh, an object or, or by the field, depending on which way the work is going. Or in other words, the energy transfer. 
uh, is equal to the charge of the object multiplied by the velocity of the object multiplied by the strength of the field it's moving through multiplied by the length of the object. Go. Uh, since uh, we've got a uh, voltage we uh, described as the amount of energy per charge, we can, uh, because the energy is in joules and work is in joules, we can think of that as work per charge. So in order to make uh, an electric charge move through, we need to do work on it. So that's why we can make that switch. Uh, from that, we know uh, from, what do we know this? From uh, last time we know that the voltage equal uh, the uh, charge multiplied by the velocity of that charge uh, moving through a field, multiplied by the strength of that field, multiplied by the length of that object, which was uh, this guy for work, so that's that guy, has been slotted in per charge, so divide by Q, those Qs will cancel. So the voltage that an object will experience uh, as it moves through some electric charge, so the velocity multiplied by the strength of the uh, magnetic force that it's moving, uh, magnetic field that it's moving through, uh, multiplied by the length of that object. So that's a whole lot of math. The good thing is you don't have to be able to uh, rewrite those uh, by yourself. That's on your formula sheet, and that's on your uh, formula sheet. Uh, incidentally, uh, this will sometimes be this little curvy e. It's the exact uh, same thing as far as we're concerned for now. Um, you're welcome to flick through to uh, get the nuances of it, but it may well just confuse you more than anything else. So don't be too uh, terribly alarmed by it. Whenever you see this guy, um, you're almost always dealing with faults. Perfect. All right. This thing would uh, be helped a lot by a bit of an explanation. Okay. Or a diagram rather. So I've got a north magnetic pole and a south magnetic pole. So I've got my magnetic uh, field lines pointing down. Great, I've got some metal rod that I'm gonna move through. So if I had a north pole here, a south pole there, my rod is just going across like that. However, to try and give this some perspective, I've had to tilt it so that I can actually draw it on today. Cool, that rod is gonna be moving through at some velocity. Okay, it has some length. So that's what that L is, it's supposed to be the length of this thing. Cool, some velocity moving forward and there'll be some strength of that magnetic field. As that happens, uh, remember the right hand rule, uh, consider the protons just to make life a bit easier. Okay, which way is the current going? Well, if it's going this way, the protons are going this way. Okay, great, which way is the magnetic field going? Well, it's going top to down, so it's going that way. All right, right hand rule, the uh, positive charges will get pushed that way. So the positive charges are gonna wanna get pushed into the wall, into the board. Okay, what happens with the electrons? Well. Unsurprisingly, they're the opposite charge, they get pushed the exact opposite way. So you've got a separation of charges, the positives are going this way, the negatives are going that way. As I've drawn there, positive into the board, negatives out of the board for this particular arrangement. Keep in mind, if the magnetic field is pointing the other way, everything would get flipped. Uh, so you've just got to be a little bit careful, use your right hand rule. If you want to know exactly what the voltage is from uh, the ends of the uh, rod, you're chucking it in uh, this guy, so so long as you know how fast the rod is moving, what the strength of the magnetic field is, and how long the rod is, you can figure out what the voltage across there, the potential difference is. Beautiful, that's 4.1. 4.2 is just one extra little uh, bit. So uh, voltage is going to equal all of this stuff. Um, N is the number of loops, we'll come back to that. We've got this uh, D theta, uh, not theta, D phi, uh, DT. If you know calculus, you know what that's saying. If you don't know calculus, that's fine. We're gonna approximate this for this subject anyway. Um, the change in uh, phi divided by the change in T, okay? Remembering that phi was magnetic uh, flux and T is gonna be time. Uh, again, we're gonna have uh, flux in Weber's, time in seconds because SI units and volt, voltage in volts, unsurprisingly. Cool, I'll come back. Oh, the N is just the number of loops, so I might as well do it now before I forget. Uh, so if I've got one of these imaginary squares, I'm gonna make that out of a wire. Cool, I could have just one loop of wire, or I could have two, or I could have as many loops as I want. So that N just says, oh, okay, you've got this effect, but you've got the wire looping around, so you've gotta multiply the effect for however many laps you're gonna do. That's all the N does. So it should be a nice multiple uh, of one. So it should be an integer, positive integer. 
Uh, great. So I've got my imaginary, uh, sorry, I've got my loop of wire here. I'm just going to make it one single loop for uh, this drawing. Uh, I've made them squares just because that's uh, <laughs> commonly the way they'll give them to you in the text. Great. This is going to progress through this field and out the other side. So time A is where I'm starting, time G is where I'm ending. Okay, well, let's think about what's happening. What's the flux in the first one? All right, well, I've got no magnetic field out here, so I've got no magnetic flux. Okay, I move to time B. I'm partially inside the field now. Okay, so I've increased slightly. Great. I've moved to time C. Now I'm completely in the field. I'll denote that with a double plus. So I'm completely in the field. Great. I'm still completely in the field. Double plus. Still completely in the field. F. Okay, I've started to move out. I'm still partially in the field though. G. Nothing. So hopefully that's pretty easy and intuitive. Great. All right. Change in phi. Okay. Well, that means I'm going to have to look at two neighboring times. So from zero to plus, that's gone up. From plus to double plus, that's gone up. From plus to du uh, double plus to double plus, nothing happened. Same again. Here to here, I've gone minus. Here to here, I've gone minus. Cool, all right. So what does that mean for the voltage experienced in this uh, loop? Okay, remembering that our voltage is the negative of this. So this would be a negative voltage, negative voltage, no voltage, no voltage positive voltage, positive voltage. Now this, uh, just looking at it, is not the ob most obvious thing in the world. So you've got uh, this thing going through. It's got nothing happening originally because nothing's changing. Cool. As we move in here, now we've got a change. Okay, so that means we'll increase the flux, which means we're uh, going to get a negative voltage, depending on which way you define as positive and negative. Cool. As we move through, cool, I'm getting more flux into it, so I'm still going to have this negative voltage but then it stabilizes, so the voltage will die off, so back down to zero. I'm now losing flux, so now the voltage will increase. I'm still losing flux, voltage increases, and so it stays at that increased level, and then comes out, so I'm gonna uh, lose voltage again, uh, which, sorry, I'll, it comes out, so I'm, I've uh, got a positive voltage. If I leave it out here, then my change in flux would be zero, uh, yep, change in flux would be zero, so let's just make an extra stage. Another one out here. Cool. So I get negative of zero is zero. We'll cover this in a bit more detail uh, because it's easier if you draw a full graph, but for now it's just getting the idea of what flux is, what change in flux is, and therefore what your voltage directions should be. So that's 4.1. 4.2. If you get stuck at all, do ask uh, questions. I fully expect that that will definitely happen. Um, this stuff is okay once you get it, but you can always stuff up which way is going up and down. Uh, you need your right hand rule as well, so hopefully we've got that under our belts by now. And that's it. That's 4142. Okay, email me if you get stuck. Bye.